Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patricia Reuter Lorenz, and I chair the Department of Psychology. Let me extend a warm welcome to all of you. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Richard Nisbet. Theodore M. Newcomb Distinguished University Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan. Professor Nisbet is the author of the new book, Mindware, Tools for Smart Thinking. This book is on sale in the lobby, as many of you may have noticed, along with several of his others. And the proceeds from tonight's sales will be going to the University of Michigan Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, fondly known as CRLT. We will also be giving away an autographed copy of the book at the end of tonight's lecture by drawing from the cards you filled out, hopefully, in the lobby today. So this talk is also a kickoff event for our new community lecture series featuring faculty from the University of Michigan Psychology Department. These lectures will be held at the Ann Arbor Public Library on the first Wednesday of the months of November and December, and hopefully for a good time to come after that. We'll be covering topics such as aging, drug addiction, empathy, and many other topics that I'm sure you'll find of, of great interest, so we hope to see you there. Now, for one reason or another, each and every one of you decided to attend Dr. Nisbet's lecture tonight. Imagine that you were asked to explain your reasons for this decision. I mean, this is a talk about psychology, after all, so anything could happen. And my bet is that very few of you would say, I have no idea why I'm here. Most of you would offer some reasons, probably very plausible ones, and you'd probably feel pretty confident in your account. But how accurate would your expla explanation really be? How well do we really understand our own thoughts and motivations, our own reasoning and decision making? And are there things we can do or circumstances we might be part of that can cause our reasoning and our explanations to be more accurate? These are the kinds of questions that Dr. Nisbet's research has focused on over the past 45 years. Because of the importance of the problem, that is, understanding the way we think, and the elegance of his research, Dr. Nisbet's impact on the field of psychology has been profound. His research has been cited close to 10,000 times, making him one of the most influential psychologists of the modern era. He's been recognized by the highest honors bestowed by the University of Michigan, major awards in the field of psychology, including the William James Fellow Award for Distinguished Scientific Achievements from the Association for Psychological Science, the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the American Psychological Association, fellowships from the foundations of McKean Cattell, Sage, and Guggenheim, and many others. In 2002, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the highest scientific honors in the United States. Members of the Academy serve as scientific advisors to the nation. In this talk tonight, Can College Make You Smarter?, Professor Nisbet will provide us with advice, advice about thinking smarter and about ways to improve how we instruct people in smart thinking. So please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Nisbet. Thanks very much, Patty, and thanks for having the idea of starting this series, uh, which uh, is hopefully going to end up being very much like the physics uh, series on Saturday morning, which gets uh, uh, people from the entire community. Uh, there's a prior question uh, to the question of whether uh, college can make people smarter, which is, uh, can anything make people smarter? Uh, anything in the way of education? Uh, for 2,500 years, the answer to this was yes. Uh, Plato said, uh, even the dull, if they have had arithmetical training, always become much quicker than, than they would otherwise have been. We must endeavor to persuade those who are to be the principal men of our state to go and learn arithmetic. Not a bad idea. Uh, the Romans added grammar and rhetoric, a 
study of argument and persuasion. Uh, the medieval scholastics and the monasteries added syllogisms, and they insisted that syllogisms are the basis of reasoning. That's the abstract rules that we use. Uh, and the humanists and the Renaissance added uh, Latin and Greek. And the curriculum in the West was set for the next 500 years. It was possible for a late 19th century teacher of English to say, my claim for Latin as an Englishman and a teacher is simply that it would be impossible to devise for English boys a better teaching instrument. The acquisition of a language is educationally of no importance. The one great merit of Latin as a teaching instrument is its tremendous difficulty. Um, well, uh, it was easy to satirize this, uh, and uh, psychologists, as one of the first things we did in the 20th century, was to satirize what they was called the muscles of the mind theory of reasoning, or the learning Latin theory, or uh, the idea that formal discipline, that is learning abstract rules for reasoning, could actually help anybody to be smarter. And there was actually never any good evidence for that either. Uh, uh, Jean Piaget, the a great developmental psychologist, uh, did insist that there are abstract rules for reasoning that are not tied to domains. Um, and uh, he said it's uh, not syllogisms, though, it's propositional logic. And that's the whole ball game. Propositional logic is the set of abstract rules we have for reasoning. There's nothing else. And you can't teach these rules. You can only induce them, learn them by living in the world that we all live in. They're finished by adolescence, and everyone has the same abstract rule system. Now, everything I just said is wrong, uh, as it turns out. Um, we do know uh, that uh, elementary school, and maybe later, makes people smarter, at least in terms of IQ. Uh, and we know that from things like a natural experiment where uh, kids who are born, let's say, by August 31st can start school, and those who are born after that can't start school. So we get to look at what's the effect of one year of school with a perfect control group. And the answer is that at, a year of, at the end of that year of school, if you've had school, you're two mental age years ahead of the kid, one mental age year ahead of the kid uh, who hasn't had school. Uh, and it's, IQ is not the same thing as intelligence, but uh, it includes vocabulary, and vocabulary is composed of words, and words are concepts, and concepts make you smarter, and things like comprehension of the world, why do doctors go back and get more education? Uh, smarter kids uh, understand that, and going to school, although it doesn't teach you specifically that, helps you understand the way the world works. Well, does it go up as far as college? Um, we can merge that with what for me is really the same question, which is do college really, does college really provide critical thinking skills? Um, and there's a, this is a huge question now in higher education circles. Uh, does college give you tools for assessing evidence, seeking out evidence, uh, uh, causal analysis, uh, constructing arguments? Um, um, forming a testable hypothesis, critiquing arguments, et cetera. Uh, many professors think that the most important thing they have to do is to teach critical thinking skills. And I think most professors think they achieve that. Uh, but let me ask, how do you know uh, that you do that? That if you teach somebody how to critique a poem or to create a coherent narrative of historical events, or to design an experiment in microbiology, uh, how do you know that that really helps you solve ordinary problems in business and in everyday life, or make you a better critic of media claims? Well, at the moment, this question is being assessed, so far as I can tell, only by something called the college learning, collegiate learning assessment. Uh, and it gives people tasks like uh, generate a memo advising an employer about the desirability of purchasing a type of airplane that's recently crashed, um, have, uh, look at newspaper articles, accident report, recommendations, uh, and give the uh, an analysis and report uh, together with justification. People do get somewhat better uh, on this kind of thing. It's controversial just how much better they get. 
but there's no control group, and we don't know how people would do if you just left them on dry ice for four years uh, rather than sending them to college. Uh, but most importantly, these skills necessary to do that are extremely general. Uh, analysis of argument and construction of argument and so on. And it doesn't tap into a host of specific reasoning skills, tools, that we teach in universities. Now, as it happens, I've spent most of my career studying primarily how people reason about everyday life. And I focus especially on the kinds of errors we make because it's interesting and because it's important to not make errors. And what I've discovered is that some of the most important errors that we make uh, in reasoning could be avoided uh, using concepts that are taught at the university. So in my field, that includes the concept of schema, the forms that you push up against the world to understand them better, judgmental heuristics, the fundamental attribution error, which is our tendency to ignore context and situations when we're trying to explain the behavior of an object or a person in favor of presumed dispositions of the object or the person, confirmation bias, uh, which means that with given a hypothesis, one we come up with or something that someone gives us, we tend to look only for confirming evidence. So if the hypothesis A causes B, you say, well, I think of some cases of A, and did B happen too? Well, it did, it's probably true. And we fail to realize that uh, it's equally necessary to look for disconfirming evidence in order to know what's going on. Uh, statistics and probability theory have dozens of concepts. Here are some of the ones that I think are most important, especially the law of large numbers, concept of regression to the mean. These things are happening in the world all the time, uh, and uh, only some of us tend to frame the world in terms that will allow us to really get the right answer to an awful lot of problems, which really require statistics and probability. Um, and the concept of a normal distribution uh, is essential to m understanding many of those concepts I just referred to, or the normal distribution. In the center of the distribution, you have the mean. And as you get further and further away from the mean, events get rarer and rarer. And this describes IQs, heights, number of dud carburetors produced at the Ford plant, number of eggs produced by chickens in a hen house. The world seems to want to be arranged this way, uh, normal distributions, and you need to know this and its properties uh, to really understand the world uh, completely. Scientific method provides concepts that are really crucial for understanding uh, things that we encounter in the media, uh, and for just understanding whether Jane is really a nice person or Joe is really a competent guy. Economics provides a lot of uh, tremendously important tools for making good decisions and judgment. Logic uh, has uh, tools like Venn diagrams and so on that really make a lot of reasoning a lot easier. And philosophy of science gives us a lot of tools like parsimony or KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, that's another way of putting that. Concept of reductionism, uh, what's falsifiable in the way of a proposition and what's not, and so on. So um, some awfully powerful tools are being taught here in the context of doing the kind of work that you may do in some field. Uh, but do they escape into everyday life and ordinary business decisions which have nothing to do with what people are specifically trained for? Um, well, let's look at examples of some everyday problems and some of the kinds of tools that I've just been showing you which can be applied to them. So um, let's think about the law of large numbers. Um, I tell you that there's a town with two hospitals, one with about 15 births per day and one with about 45 births per day. Uh, and then I ask, at which of those hospitals do you think there would be more days in the year in which 60% or more of the births were boys? A uh, brand new freshman here, uh, will tell, half of them will say it doesn't make any difference. Of the other half, half will say it's probably the larger hospital, and half will say it's probably the smaller hospital. 
what's necessary is to conceptualize this problem as samples drawn from a population where the population is all babies born this year in the town or the world. Or, uh, and these are samples of various sizes. And once you've defined it as a sample of a pop population, it's obvious that the larger that sample is, the closer you're going to get to the population parameter, which is presumably about 50%. The main use of the law of large numbers is understanding how much evidence we have to have to assess a proposition of a given kind. And that turns out to depend crucially on variability of the dimension in question. And uh, understanding uh, what the variability is depends most of the time, for most of us, uh, on uh, experience in the world, observing uh, variability. So people would perfectly well understand that it would be a bad idea to try and judge how good a quarterback somebody is by observing him at practice for half an hour. Uh, you'd say, well, that's, uh, 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 that's just not remotely enough. I mean, think of the adage, any, on any given Sunday, any team in the NFL can defeat any other team in the NFL. There's just huge variability. On the other hand, I think probably most of us have been told by people, I don't think we ought to hire Joe. I've interviewed him, spent 30 minutes with him. It didn't seem like a very hot prospect to me. How is that different? Uh, well, the answer is it, it isn't different. Uh, the reason we make that mistake is that we don't see the variability there. We don't see Joe across many different interviews. We don't recognize our own contribution and accidents. I'm saying, oh, you went to you went to Tufts? No kidding. I went to Tufts. What did you think about old Dr. Powell? Yeah, and then we're off to the races. Or uh, you 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 went to Colgate. Uh, I have a friend whose father went to Colgate, uh, and it's not going to go so well uh, from there on. And in fact, the interview, uh, the value is, as a predictor is that. If you're trying to choose between genuinely superior Jane and less superior Joan, uh, then you go from a 50-50 chance from flipping a coin to a 53% chance of getting the right person if you rely totally on the interview. That's how poor the prediction is. Uh, meanwhile, if you go with the much more exhaustive information in the folder, GPA, ability tests, prior job experience, letters of recommendation, it's easy to get up to a 65 or 70 percent chance of getting the right person. Um, people sometimes talk about uh, 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 explanations for the sophomore slump in baseball. Uh, the best baseball player, the rookie of the year, is rarely the best player the next year. And from, I assure you, from a brand new freshman here, you'll get only deterministic causal explanations from that, for that. They'll say, well, maybe um, the pitchers make the necessary adjustments, or maybe the guy gets so cocky. Uh, but the proper way to think about this um, is uh, to look at how that guy got to. Uh, the end of that distribution? How did it get all the way over to the right? Well, certainly by having uh, a tremendous amount of ability, much more ability than the average, but everything else went right for that guy. Uh, he got just the right coaching for him. The, by chance, the first couple, three games, he did very well, built his confidence, he met the girl of his dreams. But the next year, the great dice roller uh, gave him an elbow injury uh, and his girlfriend dumped him and somebody else got all the breaks, and that's the guy who got better. Uh, more generally, extreme scores uh, are rare, uh, and they're rare in any circumstance where there's substantial variability, or you can think of it as error variance, uh, in which case uh, the, the, your expectation from an extreme score on some dimension with variability is the next observation will be less extreme. One of my favorite examples of the kind of trouble we can get in for not recognizing regression to the mean comes from Danny Kahneman, psychologist uh, example. He was telling uh, Israeli flight instructors how to do instruction. He said, you know, psychologists know that it's much more effective to tell people um, that uh, their performance has been extremely good and why it's good than it is to tell them about a particularly bad uh, uh, 
uh, performance and why that's bad. Uh, and pandemonium breaks out in the room and it's, oh, we don't know what you're talking about, professor. Uh, I'm telling you in the, in the flight training business, uh, if you praise what some guy does on a really good maneuver, odds are next time around, it's gonna be worse. On the other hand, if you really yell at him for a terrible maneuver, odds are it's, the next time around it's gonna be better. So uh, the regression to the mean concept is lying around in plain sight all the time, and you're a lot better off if you understand it. Let me talk about just two concepts from scientific method. One is the deficiency of observational methods, or purely correlational methods, as compared to the experimental method. Um, in the early 1950s, uh, somebody observed that there was a correlation between the amount of ice cream that was consumed in the U.S. and the incidence of polio. Uh, and there was actually a movement to uh, ban ice cream. But of course, something else was driving both of those. In hot weather, people eat ice cream, and in hot weather, kids go to swimming pools where they were picking up polio. Uh, I just recently saw in the New York Times uh, an op-ed piece by an educator who said it would really be important to teach high school students Latin and Greek uh, because if those who've had that get uh, an average of 150 uh, points higher on the SAT verbal. Uh, well, of course, uh, I mean, he's recaptured the, uh, the, uh, the Renaissance view of uh, the advantage of Latin and Greek, but of course something else is driving that correlation. Kids who take Latin and Greek are going to better schools on average. Most places don't teach Greek, uh, and uh, they're probably more talented and more motivated to begin with. Uh, the, the problem there, and it, uh, and it again, is lying around in plain sight all the time, is uh, self-selection. Um, recently, I saw in the New York Times uh, an article on the safety of automobiles. They uh, defined as the number of deaths per million drivers per auto. And it turned out, for example, that there are enormously more deaths per million driver miles in Ford F-150 pickups than there are in Volvo station wagons. But I have a quiz for you. See if you can match the driver with the auto. We don't say, Billy, uh, the auto you'll be driving is a lovely powder blue Volvo station wagon. Uh, Vol Billy and everybody else selects uh, their autos and they bring along with them, with that selection, all kinds of attributes of themselves as drivers and the kind of circumstances where they drive. The other point I want to make is, and the world is changing enormously in this, in this respect, uh, and that is the amount, number of experiments that got done and that could get done if you thought about it. Google has been a leader in this. Google has a derisory term for what it is that most businesses do when they're just trying to decide what, how it, course shall we take here, what, what shall we do in this case, and that is you go and get the hippo. That's the highest paid person's opinion. Uh, or you can do what Google is doing all the time, dozens of experience, experiments on millions of subjects, that's us, uh, which is better. It's called A-B testing. Blue border, red border. Uh, in 2007, uh, Obama went to Google and was uh, interviewed by Eric Schmidt in front of Google employees, and uh, Obama kept talking about the importance of science and evidence to him and how he would run the presidency accordingly. And there was a guy in the audience that day who decided to go to work for Obama and set up something that was a first in campaigns, a completely A-B tested uh, campaign. Uh, so <clears throat> um, the... Uh, Which combination of image and text would you think would get the most clicks to follow the Obama campaign? Um, a, a turquoise portrait of Obama, a black and white picture of the Obama family, uh, a video of Obama giving a talk, uh, click on learn more, join us now, or sign up now. I, I find I don't have intuitions about it. 
this. And if I did, they almost surely wouldn't be worth anything. A favorite expression around Google is that assumptions tend to be wrong. <clears throat> and as a social psychologist, that's one of my favorite sayings too. Assumptions about novel human behavior or human behavior in novel situations tend to be wrong. Mine do anyway. Uh, so uh, it turns out that the best of these uh, is 40% uh, better than the worst. And that happens to be, by the way, the, the family photo and learn more. Uh, well, that kind of difference is the difference between success and failure for an enterprise. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the hippo can uh, function all at once. It's not going to come up with an answer remotely as reliable as that one. Suppose you're a, uh, a retailer. You own a grocery store. Uh, probably you, uh, your groceries are displayed in categories, aisle four for sodas, six for soups. In Japan, they tend to do things holistically so that they'll have uh, all of the ingredients for Italian food and all the ingredients for Chinese food, etc. So I'm at, maybe, well, maybe that would work in the U.S. And so, well, you know, probably what works for the Japanese works for them. What works for us works for us. In fact, the holistic method is better, even in this country, and it's better both for the grocer because uh, you sell more stuff. Uh, the, uh, the customer who wanted to make Italian food uh, remembers to buy the Romana cheese because it's sitting right there with everything else. And it's better for the customer because when the customer gets home, he's, the customer does, oh my God, I forgot the Romana cheese. Uh, and then we have to go to McDonald's or eat a TV dinner. Uh, fruits and vegetables uh, are a very high profit item for grocery stores. They're also a high profit item for the, co for the consumer because they're better to eat for than most of the things that grocery stores have. So um, uh, how could you increase? Uh, just Well, just start stuff. Do some A-B testing stuff. Somebody's tried putting up a sign in front of the grocery store saying, the average customer buys X dollars worth of uh, produce. Uh, that increases the amount that's sold. Um, or you can put a sign in the cart saying, put fruits and vegetables in front of cart. That doubles the sales uh, of fruits and vegetables. Well, there are millions of opportunities to do experiments in your own life. Um, do things go better when you have coffee? Are you more alert and effective? Or does it make you jittery and irritable? Uh, you're not going to find out just by observing things. I had coffee this morning because uh, my husband poured uh, coffee for me and I was going to have tea. I mean, you, you have to flip a coin when you go into the kitchen to decide whether you're going to have coffee or not, if you're going to find out the answer to that one or the answer to is yoga good for you uh, or is uh, what causes you to have uh, uh, acid indigestion and so on. We pay a huge price as a society for the experiments that don't get done. Uh, we paid, uh, we have so far paid $200 billion for Head Start. And we don't know whether Head Start does any good. Uh, there's never been random assignment to the program. We do know that there are things you can do for poor minority kids that have a huge effect on the amount of education they get later in life, the likelihood that they'll be uh, criminals, et cetera. They tend to be more intensive than Head Start, different in various ways. Maybe we should have been putting our money into that or fewer kids into these more intensive programs. We don't know. A huge amount of money. We don't know whether it did any good. Uh, on 9-11, 9,000 grief counselors uh, parachuted into New York, uh, and uh, they did what seems to me to be a very sensible thing. They get people in groups. People report about their experiences, what their feelings were. The counselor uh, tells them, uh, these experiences are normal, they're to be expected, and assures them that, uh, that the trauma uh, will uh, be much less in the not too distant future. In fact, it does no good. Uh, there is in fact some evidence that people, that for some people, trauma lasts longer if they've been through grief counseling than if they haven't. Um, there's a program that a couple of uh, uh, prisoners in a New Jersey prison, prison a while back came up with, called, which has be become called by ABC TV, Scared Straight. Strikes me as a good idea. You bring junior high kids uh, into the prison, you tell them how horrible it is, how incredibly boring, how bad the food is, the violence, and so on. 
this actually increases the likelihood of crime by a junior high school student by 10 to 15 percent. Um, sounds like a great idea to me. It's a perfectly terrible idea. Uh, the estimated cost per dollar spent on scared straight is $200 in incurred crime and incarceration to costs. Well, there are lots of principles of microeconomics which are tremendously valuable. Uh, and uh, let me just give one example of the sunk cost uh, trap. Um, and a uh, uh, per perfect example for me of that is uh, my first year of graduate school. Uh, my first project was something, I think, on birth order and personality. I spent a lot of time generating the materials, running the subjects, analyzing the data. When I get through with the analysis, it looks like there's nothing there. So I hope and pray that my advisor can find something, Stanley Schachter, a very eminent social psychologist. And he says, kiddo, I'm sorry. You win some and you lose some. There's nothing here. That's unacceptable. I mean, this is what I've done with myself in graduate school. So I dive back into the data, analyze some more, run a couple of subsidiary studies. At the end of several weeks, nothing. Now, if there had been an economist at my side when I was making the decision as to what I should do after these crummy data come out, and he said, oh, well, before you analyze those data, suppose somebody else had collected those data. Would you be reanalyzing them now? I would say, you've got to be kidding. This stuff is crap. I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't touch that. Uh, and so the economist said, right, that's the answer. And so you shouldn't either, because you can't retrieve that time you spent. It's gone. No use crying over the spilled milk. Waste not, want not is a very good uh, maxim, but you can't waste anything you haven't already, uh, uh, if you've already expended it. Um, an example that I find many people find telling, suppose you bought a basketball ticket a month ago for 50 bucks for a game in Detroit. Tonight's the night, but the star is not playing. Um, the, uh, nothing hangs on the outcome of this game, and it's started to snow, and it's 40 minutes away. I don't really want to go to that thing, but God, I don't want to waste the 50 bucks. Again, you need your economists saying, you know, honk, wrong. You can't waste that 50 bucks. That's gone. What you can do is pay twice, once for the ticket and once for the boring game. So save yourself that extra cost. Um, economists are a different species from the rest of us. They walk out of movies all the time. They don't eat expensive fish that, that they just paid a lot for if it's no good. Uh, the economist's motto, and it should be yours, is the rest of my life begins now. 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 Um, the other important concept, absolutely essential, is the opportunity cost. Um, the definition of an opportunity cost is the most valuable alternative that has to be given up in order for you to engage in a particular activity. And this has applications across a huge range of personal choices. Suppose you own an office building and you need an office uh, yourself. Um, did you use an office in that building? Well, it feels like it's free, and an accountant might actually say it is free. But an economist would say uh, it may or may not be free. If you could get an equally good office for less money in somebody else's building, you're paying an opportunity cost for having that office in your own building. Um, by the way, people who understand sunk cost, opportunity costs, and cost-benefit analysis do better. Professors at this university who live by these microeconomic rules make more money than professors who don't, and students who uh, understand these concepts uh, get higher grades than students who don't. And it's not because they're smarter, uh, because um, they're not, actually. Uh, they're overachievers. They do better than you would expect, given their, uh, their abilities. Well, I'm not going to talk about uh, logical rules, except to say that the logic of the conditional is embedded deep down in all kinds of, of, of analytic procedures that we do. If P, then Q. P is the case, therefore Q is the case. It's necessary for a lot of causal analysis, understanding necessity and sufficiency, uh, et cetera. Also for understanding contractual relations, like uh, permissions and obligations. Um, and um, the... Uh, 
So these are just some examples of those 40 concepts that I used, and I think you can see these are helpful things. Are students getting this stuff? So we created a test of statistical and methodological reasoning, the kinds of homely, everyday examples that I've been talking about. We gave it to students on the way in as they're beginning their freshman year, and we gave it to them after four years. And here's what happened. Students in the natural sciences and the humanities gained really quite significantly. Uh, 20, they did 25% better on these things. It's a lot more problems to solve sensibly. Uh, students in the social sciences and in psychology gained hugely. Of course, they're the ones who are getting statistics, probability, and the kinds of methodology that applies to everyday life as opposed to uh, biochemistry experiments. Uh, in terms of logic, uh, students in the natural sciences and the humanities gain hugely. Students in social science and psychology gain nothing. Uh, I suspect that the gains for the natural scientists are, uh, students are mostly due to the math courses they take, because the more the correlation between math courses and, and performance on this test is 0.7, which is very big. Uh, I honestly don't know why the humanities students get so much in this regard, although they're constantly analyzing arguments of various kinds, uh, and this probably packs down into a better understanding of conditional logic. Then, just very briefly, I'll say we did, I looked at the effect of two years of graduate school in uh, law, medicine, psychology, and chemistry. These are different studies on the left. Uh, yeah, that's um, looking at different people at the same time at the beginning of two years, the ones who are just starting uh, their two years, the ones who are just finishing two years. On the right, it's the same people and we're looking at how much they gain. We get exactly the same results, whichever design we use. The psychology students are gaining enormously. Law and chemistry students are basically not gaining anything. To my surprise, medical students gain a lot. Uh, so I went to medical school for a couple of days to see what's going on and resolve the mystery. They're talking constantly about the reliability of measures, the validity of tests. Uh, they're talking about uh, what's the probability that the patient has this disease, given that he has symptoms X, Y, and Z? Would you pay for that, ex that, for that uh, uh, test or not? No, nope, it's not a very good test. It's very expensive, very unlikely disease. I mean, it's just they're, they're constantly using these principles. Now, the amazing thing about this, the tremendously important thing about this, is that they're, they're doing this stuff only for medicine and health but it's escaping to everything else because very few of our questions on this, on this test have to do explicitly with medicine and health. And we keep finding this in our research that, uh, that you can teach in one domain and it'll just jump uh, to other domains uh, to, a, to a, a degree that really is very surprising to me. Um, okay. Um, so, logic, okay. Um, people in law, medicine, and psychology all gain in logic of the conditional. Chemistry students don't gain. But the gains for those who are getting it are very significant, very substantial. So, the story to this point is very much a good news, bad news story. The good news story is that a lot of people are getting a lot of very important stuff out of college. The bad news is that some people aren't getting that stuff. So the question then becomes, can we give that stuff to other people short of giving them another, a second undergraduate education? And it's pretty clear from our research that you can. For example, uh, we teach the law of large numbers. Uh, in various ways. In one way, we teach it purely abstractly by showing them a, an urn with gumballs, red and white gumballs, and we draw samples of various sizes, and we show them. We define sample, population, parameter, and we show them physically what happens in this abstract setup. The larger the sample, the cl closer you get to the true population value. Uh, other students, we don't do any abstract teaching at all. We just everything by example. So we might say, um, David uh, is a high school senior. 
He has to choose between uh, two colleges, A and B. They're equal on all kinds of grounds. He has friends at both. His friends at College A like it a lot on intellectual and social grounds. His friends at B are not so crazy about it on, uh, in any respect. Uh, but he visits both places uh, for a day. And uh, at College A, um, he doesn't meet any students who are very interesting. Uh, a couple of professors give him a brush off. At College B, he meets a lot of you know, really interesting, exciting people that he thinks he'd like to be around. A couple of professors take a personal interest in him. Which college do you think he should go to? You will not find a U of M beginning freshman who will say anything other than he has to go where his heart calls him to go. He's not his friends. He has to go where he, uh, where the place that he thinks is best. And you say, well, let's see. Let's think of that one day that David spent at each of these places as a sample of the population of events that could happen to you over a year at these places. Can we agree that's a really a pretty small sample? And this tends to have an impact on people. Yeah, that really isn't a hell of a lot uh, to know about. Well, abstract training on this problem increases uh, solutions um, from 40% level for control to 55%. Examples training increases uh, by 55%. And they're essentially additive. Uh, if you give both abstract and concrete example training, you get 65% uh, improvement. Uh, you get 65% solution of these problems. Now, the amazing thing is you can teach in one domain and get just as much gain in another domain immediately as if you'd taught in that domain. So uh, that's a, looking at the immediate test. So you can, you can teach people in one domain and test them in the same domain. They do a little about 1.8 on the scale here. Uh, and they do virtually as well on the other domain that you haven't even mentioned. There's no loss over a two-week period uh, on the same domain. And although there's loss on the different domain, there's still significant uh, retention. Uh, so um, I can't teach logic by abstract means, but I can teach it with causal reasoning schemas and with contractual problems. And I can teach it on con causal schemes, and it gets payoff on the contractual schemas, or, or vice versa. And we also get a trickle-up effect. No trickle-down from abstract rules, but there's a trickle-up. They do better on abstract problems after they've worked through these concrete uh, problems. And the mo I, to me, the most exciting stuff is how easy it is to make a big difference to the way people think and behave with 30 minutes of instruction in cost-benefit analysis, sunk cost, and opportunity cost. In fact, when we call them uh, several weeks later in a totally different guise, we say this is an ISR survey on opinions, and we find out, you know, have they, have they walked out on any sports events that they've been to in the past uh, few weeks, uh, et cetera. Their behavior and their judgments uh, are influenced by, uh, by those experiences. So, uh, the big lesson here is if you're a professor, I mean, why don't professors do more examples of various things? By the way, economics courses at this university, when the study was done, which is a good many years ago, did not have an impact. Seniors uh, were no more likely to solve the problems if it, uh, if it had several courses than if it had none uh, in economics. Uh, I'm not sure that would be true today. I went and looked at economic, microeconomics texts in the bookstore, and I can hardly imagine that students today wouldn't, just from the text alone, get a lot out of the opportunity cost treatment, both in a text by Glenn Hubbard and by one by uh, Paul Krugman. They have m many pages on them, many different examples across the boards. I can hardly imagine they're not learning that today. I doubt they're certainly not picking up sunk cost, however from their microeconomics text. I don't know what the professors are doing. But uh, Krugman has less than a page on the topic, only one example. Hubbard does hardly better. So anyway, so why don't professors give more examples than they do? And I think you know, maybe what's not in the job description, and this is the way we've always taught statistics, that may be a part of it. Part of it may be that uh, they just think that, you know, you can't, uh, they, you can't, 
expect that a few examples would actually transfer to everyday life. You know, I live this stuff in my life, and I can see how to use it, but I, I can't give them all that. You'd be surprised, I think, how much you probably can give them uh, with a few uh, well-chosen examples, how much people can be counted on to generalize from them. So what would a critical thinking course for people look like uh, at the university? I don't think it would. Does anybody know whether there is a critical thinking course taught here? I've asked a couple of philosophers, and they don't think so. Uh, so, uh, but we should, <laughs> but not necessarily the way it gets taught elsewhere. If you look at the text, I mean, it's full of logic and syllogisms and fallacies and formalisms of various kinds. So people say, well, uh, what are some reasoning rules? And let's put them in the book. But it, what I'm proposing, you start with, what, what is it that your field teaches that actually affects the way you think about things that matter in your everyday life and that would make you less of a sucker for what you see, uh, claims that you see in the media. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it would look more like this, the kind of concepts that are in uh, my book, uh, Mindware. These are 40 or so of the 100 or so concepts in there. I believe that you can gain from very brief treatment of most of, these, most of these things. You have to define things in informal terms. By the way, don't ever look up concepts uh, in, in Wikipedia and expect you're going to get anything out of it. I look, as I was writing my book, I would look up a concept in Wikipedia and say, God, I don't know what the hell that said. I don't <laughs> understand. Just, you know, waste not, want not. And sunk cost, you know. Don't cry over spilled milk. I mean, say it lots of informal ways. Give uh, informal examples. However, I'm very much aware of the fact that I'm just one person. I'm a psychologist. These concepts are the ones that I know. Uh, uh, first of all, I know that all of them can be uh, applied to problems that matter uh, and make better. And I, and I know that some of them are, are readily teachable. Others are sufficiently similar to that that I'm pretty confident that relatively brief treatment can actually give people some gain. But there's a much, much larger range of concepts. First of all, the, in, these individual concepts here, people from other fields are going to have better examples than I could ever come up with. Uh, people are going to have, uh, in other fields, are going to have different concepts. Uh, so uh, let me uh, ask you, uh, if you are a professor, to think of how does your discipline affect the way you think about everyday life uh, and, uh, and how might you use it? please send me that uh, at that email address. And if you're a student and you've picked up a concept in a course that you feel like really made a difference for how you understood some important uh, problem that had nothing to do with the field uh, where you logged it, uh, please send that to me. I'll pool these and I'll return them to you. I should say I think the University of Michigan is the ideal place to build uh, uh, an omnibus uh, critical thinking course because there is more interdisciplinary contact here than any other university I know anything about. I mean, a lot of the reason I could teach this is I've collaborated with, with economists and learned their tricks and said, oh, gee, that applies to a lot of things. And I think I know how I might be able to teach that. I've collaborated with statisticians and with, uh, with philosophers and so on. So a lot of that happens. So uh, Thank you for being here on this gloomy evening, and uh, thank you in advance for sending me concepts that you think might be usefully taught. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, you'll give me a high sign when you think it's enough. Yeah. Uh, we have. Um, a few minutes for questions and observations. Uh, Can we use the mic? Or? Yeah. Oh, there's a mic. Yeah, there are mics if you. Okay. One uh, aspect about higher education that has evolved that is disturbing to me involves what you suggest as critical thinking. And that's how. Um, Ethics seems to be the sacrificial lamb to promoting a university. And I use the University of Michigan as an example. The hospital, for instance, has this inherent fetish 
with information that is provided to them by U.S. News and World Report, which is an unscientific survey at best. They know that. Other people in the administration, I brought this to their attention, and I had one person say to me, no harm, no foul. I said, what do you mean? Well, if the information isn't accurate, does it hurt anybody? Well, no, I mean, it doesn't cause any physical illness or harm, I guess. Well, if it helps promote the university, that's a good reason to utilize it. And it really upsets me to see how ethics has, as I said, become a sacrificial lamb in self-promotion. So, and, and the specific complaint is that, is what exactly, that the rankings? Well, you, you were talking about critical thinking. I don't think the university itself sets a good example of critical thinking in examining information that they use to further their mission. I mean, who would use an unscientific survey to substantiate bogus information? You mean like U.S. News and World Report surveys of quality of, inst of departments and... It only publishes when they release a survey. Right. And I had a dean from one of the colleges here tell me that he does not answer their survey information anymore, request for information, because he says, how would anybody at the University of California, for instance, know about any programs that we have innovated here in our school in the last 12 months? Harvard, at one point many, many years ago, was rated as among the top three uh, psychology departments of the country when there, there really were hardly any psychologists there at the time. <laughs> so I do I know, think it's, it's really that sad. Be, that can be inaccurate information, that's for sure. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a cognitive psychology student, and from our views, we talk about lack of correspondence. So, for example, for like visual illusions from the lower like perceptual levels, that even if you see it or you know it, that is illusion that you still can't change your perceptions. And when I think of my view of like false memory, even though that we know that memory gets changed each time that when you retrieve it, but sometimes we still can't like change our memory to be accurate. Um, but it seems to me that what you're proposing here is it's asking, sort of like it's answering one of the fundamental questions that psychology asks is whether we could change human behavior in a way that by telling them some of the, the rules that we study from human behavior. And um, I'm very happy to see that you're giving a pretty optimistic view about like in college, there are some critical thinking skills that we may be able to teach our students or among ourselves to change our behaviors. So do you think this is actually, when you're proposing this critical thinking course, this is in itself, in a way, it's like an imp empirical experiment, an empirical questions that you're asking whether that's possible. Like, how do you feel that and how, how, how do you think of that? How do I think of what now? Sorry. Um, so I'm just making the sub like, a contrast between like from some of the domain in psychology we talk about like perceptions that even if we know that's illusions we still cannot unsee it or, or maybe like we even though we know something that's like visual illusions we still cannot overcome that but when we know that there's heuristics or there's like um, com conformatory biases whether it's actually able to overcome that by teaching people those rules. Right. Uh, well, actually, there, there are some int very interesting differences among the kinds of rules that I've studied uh, in terms of uh, whether knowing it easily changes your judgment and behavior. Uh, perceptual illusions, and I can say that table is actually the same length as that one, and you say, I'm sorry, it's obviously not. You measure it and you say, I don't know, I don't know what happened to the ruler. I mean, because the, 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 the illusion is so profound. And what I call the interview illusion is equally profound. I mean, uh, I can tell you all, I can tell you, I know huge amounts of the failures of interviews across anything, anytime anybody's ever looked at the 30 minute unstructured interview predicting anything student behavior, employer behavior, medical uh, practice of doctors when they get out, uh, military training school, 
but when I interview someone, I have a real feeling, by golly, I know pretty well what that person is like. It's, it's like a perceptual illusion. On the other hand, a lot of the other stuff isn't like that at all. I mean, you really are different people. If you didn't know about sunk costs before you came in here before, you're a different person than when you came in. It doesn't take a lot to totally change people's ability to reframe situations where they're saying, I can't waste them. I say, wait a minute, it's already wasted. Uh, I get letters from people saying, thank you, you saved me from staying in this stupid apartment. Uh, so. <laughs> Sure. Uh, great talk. I, I was just curious if you could comment briefly um, on, I think, your overall conclusion, which is that college students can be taught uh, critical thinking skills that make them smarter, and this literature on cognitive training, um, which seems to show that in many cases cognitive training in other domains doesn't work uh, very well. Just wondered what you think might be the critical difference between the skills you're talking about and the, and the kinds of skills that are being trained in, in other uh, domains. Right. Well, it's a, a variant of the, of the question that we were just talking about. Um, I don't have a clear set of rules about what kinds of concepts are going to be. I, what I, I do have the concept of uh, graceful concepts <laughs> that, that enter easily into your or a repertoire. Law of large numbers is one, it's, a, it's lovely because you are actually, a very young child uses the law of large numbers all the time. When, when there's a, conce a clear conception of, of the variability in some type of event, uh, they realize, oh, well, you know, this is my observation here, but it's not enough. I mean, a very young child will see that. So there's the, that's a, so the, to all you're doing when you teach the law of large numbers in a formal way is just expanding that. Uh, concept and, and, and the, do, the domains that it applies. And, and basically, and I've come to think that the crucial thing there is understanding whether I can see the damn variability or not. It's there, and so I can't regard this evidence as sufficient. But that's, that's a kind of a minor fix on a concept that is quite, that's quite intuitive. Other things are, uh, of course, much, much more. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, prob for some reason, I've always thought probabilistic. It's just always been natural. I think about everything in terms of probability, to the, to the point that I annoy friends and relatives uh, about uh, estimating probabilities. But uh, some of you are familiar with, the, with Bayes, Bayesian uh, probability. I cannot use that thing. I can, I, mean, I, can, I can repeat like a parrot what the hell thing is, but I can't use it in everyday life. And I think it's actually, I'm not, an, I'm not, I'm not an unique in that respect. I think that's not a graceful concept in the sense it doesn't slide easily into our, our repertoire. Okay, so one more and then we should stop. Okay. Thanks so much, great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on small liberal arts colleges versus big universities. So I'm somebody who went to a small college and now I'm here as a psychology graduate student at a big university and I've seen how different they are. And I feel like at a big university like this, on one hand there's so many opportunities to learn things but at the same time, there, it's almost not possible because like, you know, let's say like as a GSI, I could have 75 students and I would love to teach them better critical thinking, but it's just not feasible. And similarly, I feel like a professor could have hundreds of students and it's because their main, um, they're not just teaching, they're doing many other things that I feel like that gets left behind. Right, uh, well, of course, that's a, a huge topic that's largely beyond my expertise, but I do think, I mean, a lot of these things, you really can teach them from the podium. I mean, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to, Mix, you don't have to have students, seven students over to your house for wine uh, and, and concept alteration. Uh, you can really teach some of them uh, 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 in that way. Uh, I should say, though, that this, the whole concept of uh, assessing how well individual colleges do at teaching critical thinking terrifies an awful lot of people in higher education. I think a lot of people are quite happy about the extent to which the, the only thing that's out there at the moment is that collegiate learning assessment thing. And 
Uh, it's not clear that it, any changes much anywhere for anybody. It's not clear it's a very good test. I think the kinds of things I'm talking about really do allow for, for any, you know, how well, how well does how much of this stuff get across at various universities? Because we know it's teachable, we know how to teach it, and is it getting done uh, at that place? So, but that's, um, that's 10 years, 15 years down the road. From, from, but but the, I do think the route that I'm going is the, is the way to do that. And I think we should be assessing schools. I think we should be comparing state universities as a group to liberal arts colleges and, and Ohio State to University of Michigan as if that were necessary. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. I'm just... So the, the, the last... Uh, event is for me to name the person who will get this book, and that is um, Nazri Sarkis. Is Nazri Sarkis here? Ah, so <laughs> why don't you come up and Professor Newsom will give you the book. <laughs> And this, this is not a put-up job. <laughs> so let's thank Dr. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>